So now my Hari Mai, that's our traditional welcome. <coughs> You'll hear it more widely than we've had in recent years, accepting our bicultural nation. Um, so there's the headline, and let's get this here. So Mary Watt Nee was born in 1917. She was not only New Zealand's first qualified female landscape architect, but when she returned to New Zealand in 1950-51, <coughs> was the country's only active qualified associate of the British Institute of Landscape Architects. <coughs> she worked all but briefly in a post-World War II environment that was dominated by landscape gardeners and European-trained landscape architects in both England and New Zealand. And she used her undoubted skills to advocate, advocate against <coughs> the piecemeal planning approach that prevailed in 1950s New Zealand. This presentation considers her short but brilliant career drawing on her practice archives and situates her alongside her peers, the many, many notable British and British-based New Zealand landscape architects practicing during that period. Mary became known to us in the 1980s through an undated paper she read to a Wellington Planning Society meeting. This was fortuitous, uh, discovered in, um, in New and it was actually found in the papers of the town planner John W. Mawson. Uh, they were actually held in the University of Auckland and um, secured there by um, the librarian, now retired, Wendy Garvey, who I acknowledge in my <coughs> acknowledgements. But more recently, in 1993, a series of oral history tapes was lodged with the Turnbull Library here in Wellington, and more latterly, some of her business papers were deposited by a family member. Frustratingly, as a collection, these offer only a fragmentary picture of her professional life, and much more remains to be discovered. So our knowledge of Mary to date begins with her path to becoming a landscape architect. She was born in 1917 into a farming family with four older sisters. Like her sisters, she was educated by a governess in the family home at Makoya in Taranaki before attending the Chiltern St James School in Lower Hutt as a boarder. Mary's grandmother, mother, at least one other sister, Averill, who was a, a natural historian, uh, or a historian of natural history, and Uncle John Moore were, were all artistic. So we now get a look at her training, and she was employed by the Reserves Department of Dunedin City as a horticultural trainee from 1936, and that, her training took place in the uh, Dunedin Botanic Gardens. She did not undertake an apprenticeship in horticulture and gardening that was offered to some women in the 1920s. Instead, she undertook the National Diploma in Horticulture that was taught by Park Superintendent uh, David Tannock um, through evening classes. And she would also learn her training in Britain actually through evening classes there. So, So among the subjects taken by National Diploma trainees at this time were the principles and practice of horticulture, propagation of horticultural trees and shrubs, nursery management, landscape gardening, and the flower garden in all aspects, <coughs> making it, taking, making up the intermediate uh, examinations. And of course there was also a thesis, uh, which I'll describe. Interestingly, between 1929 and 1945, only, 20, only 12 women in New Zealand gained the Royal New Zealand Institute of Horticulture qualification, and eight of these were from the Dunedin Botanic Gardens. The attainment of a national diploma and the experience many women like Mary received at the Botanic Gardens enabled them to further their careers because of sound training. Some of Mary's female cohorts opened their own nurseries, became tutors of horticultural colleges um, or moved to other public gardens in New Zealand and overseas. 
um, David Tannock, who was the pioneer of this uh, training, uh, retired in 1939, and Mary was, had completed her studies then and was employed by the new superintendent as a technical assistant. That was Morris Skipworth. So these are some of the women um, training um, that come from the Dunedin City Council archives. So part of her um, role was giving talks to various women's groups, and these are uh, some of the um, talks described in 1940 and 1945. So her focus was really on the flower bed and she, um, the flower garden. So in January 1947, um, she published a 14-page paper um, in the Journal of the Royal New Zealand Institute of Horticulture that we believe was um, her national diploma thesis. And I think I've got... No, I don't have that. Oh, there it is, yes, that's... So we have, th this is the, um, the paper that she published. She was actually, um, by 1947, actually in Britain. The view there is in the Botanic Gardens in Dunedin. So now following her tertiary training, she was granted two years leave by the Dunedin City Council in 1946 to further her studies in landscape design in England, and she arrived there around July 1946. Why did she choose to pursue further training? Well, Mary, and I quote, said, she became interested in the work of Gertrude Jekyll, a contemporary of William Robinson, who together introduced the herbaceous border as it is known in English gardens. Miss Jekyll was the first person I knew about, she said, who planned gardens, and I decided I'd like to do similar work. In recording her overseas training, Mary described that she, quote, went to evening classes at the landscape section of the School of Planning and Research for Regional Development in London. So it was a, it was a planning school that the landscape her first portion of her training took place. And she noted that the students did their field work during the weekends, visiting sites for studio work, learning the elements of surveying in the countryside. And she passed her two-day exam in July 1949. And then she went on to study at the School of Architecture at the Royal College of Art in London. And here um, her supervisor was, um, and I'll describe him further on. So some of the lectures that um, are listed at the time of her training in the Journal of the Institute of Landscape Architects included the theory of landscape design, uh, the history of town and countryside, the history of garden design, um, ecology, agriculture, plant material, which is a very modern sort of term for garden plants, and uh, other topics such as garden construction, estimating and costing. Now her thesis um, and her supervisor was um, Sir Basil Ward, who was a Taranaki-born architect, became very famous in Britain, and he was uh, one of the leaders at this institution in London. So her thesis, and it was a rather long one, was titled Scheme for Landscape Architecture for a Proposed Building Development of a Large Laboratory Building on an Open Site for the University of Cambridge. And <laughs> intriguingly, <laughs> this thesis hasn't um, surfaced yet. We're hoping that the family uh, still hold it because um, it, it must have some riveting um, um, documents and plans. She was a very skilled draftswoman and um, she, she received high praise from uh, Professor Ward um, in one of her, her references that we, we have acquired through her archive at the Turnbull Library. Now the other um, area that she um, <coughs> studied uh, we call it sociology, it is quite crucial to the world, um, her world view, her new world view that she under, became to understand. 
and it was called the Le Play course, L-E-P-L-A-Y. So in addition to her study at the School of Planning and Research and the Royal College, she spent a week at the country house of the Le Play Institute of Sociology. This was located in the rural market town of Ledbury in the West Midlands. The Playhouse offered field survey trips for small groups of participants and taught a social survey model of practice that was concentrated on the study of defined geographic environments and the people who inhabited them. So here Mary, in all her writing, it, she became aware that it's people, 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 and there's a Maori saying of that, and I, I can't give it here, but it was, a, a reversal from plants to people and the people what they wanted in their environments. So far from being a dry catalogue of a district or region, the field survey study was an attempt to combine the perspectives of the natural and human sciences with the artistic and spiritual appreciation of place, leading to an understanding of the essential personality of a geographical area, along with its living qualities as well as the identification of a particular pressing social problem. And the, it was the engagement of the people in those areas, you know, guided by these uh, landscape architects in the case of Mary. Although based principally on sociological concepts, the play model also drew on social psychology, cultural geography, town planning, geomography, land use history. And in the case of Mary, her instruction was focused on the study of gardens in the English country houses. So at the time, um, the country house houses were under incredible pressure um, after, or well, before World War II and after World War II. So this methodology um, was actually derived from Frederick Laplay, his social theory. It had been developed 30 years earlier, and it was then um, modified by the Scottish biologist, sociologist and planner um, Patrick Geddes. And Patrick Geddes' student who founded the Sociological Society, Victor Branford. So we, we don't know exactly which course Mary studied in the programs um, advertised and they're well documented in the literature. Um, but we, we think it would have been within the field study methods of regional city and town and country um, studies. So having graduated as a landscape architect, Mary went to work for Peter Youngman in, um, in London. Youngman was part of a small clique of pioneer UK landscape architects, including Sir Geoffrey Jellicoe, you can see him up there on the bottom left, uh, Dame Sylvia Crow, she's in the top right, you'll know her presence in Australia, I think Richard Clough was involved with her coming to Australia, Brenda Colville and Peter Shepherd, spelt Shep, H-E-A-R-D. At the time of Mary's employment with Youngman, he was not long returned from active service with the medical corps and inventory, and was being passed private commissions by Sir Geoffrey Jellicoe to help build his practice. Youngman was described by those who knew him as extremely rational, and a concern for details and an insistence that architecture and landscape should be contextualized and complementary. Richard Clough, who was one of Youngman's students at the University College in 1950, acknowledged him as one of the practitioners who transformed landscape architecture in Europe from a garden design orientated profession to one which sought to serve the community as a whole by dealing with all aspects of land use and development. And the, the Brits currently, uh, one of their highest awards is actually the Peter Youngman Award um, on the internet, you'll see it, an awards given each year. So all those other people there um, have dropped out of the picture and, and Youngman has written as the cream of the crop, which is quite, I think it's quite an honour to think that Mary and, uh, and think of um, uh, Richard Clough um, were, were, um, were trained by him. So Youngman uh, worked on the London Festival site. So we have, we also have, this is 
probably is equally important was the Bryn Mawr rubber factory at Gwent in, Ru in Wales. Um, Louise was telling me the other day that the um, African um, concrete forms of sculpture in the ceiling of this building were actually designed by students at those institutions in London. But Mary worked um, at this stage with Peter Youngman on the design of the grounds of this institute of this factory. And it, it, as uh, Youngman said to, um, he, he um, was speaking to Geoffrey Jellicoe, recalled that this project, quote, it was a bit breathtaking, but very exciting. So there, this was quite a radical um, in, industrial site, the, the owners and the architects. Mary tended to work with quite, quite radical people <laughs> in, her, uh, in, in, in her practice. So she also went on to work uh, because of the lead in time she left, um, time she left Britain. But, so Youngman was working on the London Festival site and it had taken place the year before in, in 1950. And although she was not officially recognised as a New Zealand delegate, sorry, let's skip this. Sorry. So one of the group of five landscape architects commissioned for the open space design for the festival, he was responsible for the design of a moat garden and a rocky escarpment around the agricultural building on the south bank of the Thames. And Mary is believed to have assisted with this project. There's some of the um, images of the moat garden. So here we have some of the, um, the references that Mary received from Peter Youngman. She received uh, quite outstanding uh, testimonials from both Youngman and, um, and the prof. Um, so we're now moving into what she was doing um, alongside her work as um, working with, with Youngman. Um, so when she arrived in Britain, the Institute of Landscape Architecture was still very small and was grateful for willing members to assist in the organisation of its events. Mary helped on the planning team of the 1948 International <coughs> Conference for Landscape Architecture that took place in London's country, sorry, County Hall over four days in August 1948, and this led to the founding of the International Federation of Landscape Architects. And although she was not officially recognised as a New Zealand delegate, she was described as a student responsible for hosting the guests that came from Scandinavia to London. This group, along with delegates from 13 other nations, contributed to the displays of landscape architects uh, worldwide and was featured and we've got illustrations there on the right hand side. Um, the, to this gathering came all the leaders of, they're all landscape architects that had trained, some of them, uh, and quite a number of women, uh, back into the late 19th century, into the early 20th century. And the following year, Mary attended a regional landscape conference in Stockholm and she was encouraged to write a student paper, and that was titled First Impressions of Foreign Travel by a New Zealander. And it was published in the Institute's journal of the same year with some wonderful photographs um, that she had taken. So we also find Mary, um, before she returns to New Zealand, um, attending the, one of the first organized IFLA meetings in Madrid. And here she was one of officially a one of the dozen British delegates. It was the second international conference. And among the other delegates, of course, would have been Mr. and Mrs. Geoffrey Jellicoe and um, a person called Richard Siddell. He was another noted landscape architects, architect at the time of an older generation. So at Madrid, there were some 172 delegates um, from 22 countries in attendance. 
and this um, expanded Mary's exposure to European landscape architects. So she returned to, to New Zealand, we believe, in mid-1951. And this is an interview that, that took place here in Wellington. And she set up um, her practice with the idea of um, consulting public bodies, private companies, individuals. And she was also um, sought by um, academics um, at Auckland, Palmerston, Massey University, uh, in Sydney, in Canberra, but she didn't accept any of those uh, positions. Her return to this country as a qualified landscape architect was documented in newspapers. Um, in some of these interviews, um, I've got images here on the PowerPoint. Um, she, she, she said that um, the role of landscape architect was to, <coughs> to illustrate the benefits of imaginative planning in the design of large-scale public spaces. And she canvassed the scheme in an illustrated presentation to the New Zealand Institute of Town Planners here in Wellington in 1951. And she spoke of the need to search for character, uh, which was right for development. And she used examples of old orchard fragments which could be incorporated into parks or swampy areas that could be converted into attractive features within urban parks. And here's Mary uh, in, with this interview. Um, so, and of course the interviewer noted that um, she had a lot of sociological texts um, in her office. And the formal teaching in the social sciences of sociology was in its inf infancy in New Zealand at this time. And the School of Social Science here at the at Victoria University was the first of its kind in New Zealand and it had only started taking students uh, from 1950, primarily to teach uh, them as social workers. So the application of sociology in a discipline such as landscape architecture was no doubt of some note. Right, we're going to some further quotes about her work. I'm just watching this time. Now oh, that's, that's a sort of a good summary of some of the people that we found in her archives that she uh, designed uh, these gardens for. So you can see here there were, uh, the important one was the Bill Such, Such Garden um, in Wellington. And we think it's Robert Kennedy. I think he was a, <clears throat> probably a, an architect at Auckland University. He must have retired to Waikanae. Lady Patrick Harris um, designed her garden. We don't have any plans for these, but we have the, um, the business papers um, documenting all these projects. And that's the title of her paper in 1952 um, to a conference here in Wellington. The, uh, the, and then the bottom one is a talk she gave to the Hutt Valley um, branch of the Institute of Horticulture. So I think what I'll do now is cover it. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of quotes. Uh, Mary was very good at getting her message across. <laughs> and, and she really, from the time she left London, she got into the London papers that she was turning to New Zealand. And uh, they, th those articles featured in, in Otago and Wellington papers and then she got into these national um, pictorial magazines. But they're very deep interrogation. Uh, they're not just shallow um, once over lightly. And um, I'm sure Mary grabbed the, the draft the journalist wrote and, and made sure all the, the terminology was right. I, I've had that experience myself. You've, you've got to control um, and, and make sure it is accurate. So I'd, just to conclude, um, the people that supported Mary, because it's really important, Mary, you know, was particularly an independent character. She, 
her family, from understanding her, uh, and even her sister living in Britain, th th there was no um, close association. She, she was going to make it or break it. And, but importantly, it was Professor Basil Ward. Um, he was the Professor of Architecture at the Royal College from 47 to 53, and then he became the Letherby Professor through the 50s. He was also a partner of Murray Ward from 1945 to 65, and that firm had business in London, Hong Kong, and Libya. Her great supporter here in Wellington was John Cox, a planner, George Porter, an architect, and Mary and George, um, they won in the second prize for the Wanganui Memorial Hall in the 1950s. The other really important figure in her life was Nolene Baker. And I think we'll see here a picky of Nolene. Oops, sorry, where's that? Here we are. So in the top left-hand corner, there's Nolene Baker. So she was like a mother figure to Mary. Um, Nolene is very important in New Zealand garden history because she studied at the Slade School of Fine Art in London in the late 19th century, and she was born in, um, in Otago. She she described in a letter in 1930 that she designed um, th six gardens um, in, um, in the UK while she was caring for her ailing parents. And she was notable for involvement in the suffrage movement in Britain and received the MBE in 1920. There were other notable women designers. Um, I just mentioned one, Madeleine Irwin Nikosh, who settled in Auckland in the 1910s. But situating Mary, um, her New Zealand modernist planning and architecture, and of architecture and in the arts community, I just wanted to summarise um, some of the other people that we know that came to practice in New Zealand. And so from Switzerland via Los Angeles came Fred Chop in the 1920s, early 30s. From Australia came John Oldham and Peter Spooner in the 60s to lecture and consult the New Zealand government. In Eng from England, Stanley Hart came to practice in Auckland in the 1950s, and uh, I believe the appointment of that man was written by Mary uh, for Auckland City Council. From Canterbury, um, both Edgar Taylor and Stanley Jones, um, they were self-trained in, um, in Canterbury, one at Canterbury University, the other through nursery. And Stanley Jones was the first um, government landscape architect who worked within the housing division through the 1950s. And also from Auckland came the um, important man called Noel Cutler. He was a judge in the 1950s in, in landscape e exhibits in Hamburg and The Hague. And finally from Massey here in country here, um, Hugh Wright, he graduated to practice in Hamilton as a landscape architect. Of course, this leaves out the Mawson family, the Tybor Donner, Harry Turbot, and all the, all the graduates that came out of Lincoln from the late 60s, early 70s, and I haven't touched on them. And of course, importantly, um, as uh, Richard Clough stepped ashore in Mother England, um, Mary actually sailed back to New Zealand in late 1950. Interestingly, Mary had letters from um, various academics that um, she brought to Sydney. Um, Professor Waterhouse was one of the people that she had a letter from Sylvia Crow to deliver to him. So in, in conclusion, um, just to summarise Mary's personal life, she, she married um, Jack Watt in the 50s and she had one child, Nolene. Sadly, Nolene was killed in a car accident. There were four grandchildren. She stopped practice, we believe, because of her, her husband's commitments um, in his career. Mary died at the age of 88, um, is interned in the Haura Episcopalian Cemetery in Taranaki. And her, her legacy includes the oral tapes of her life, her correspondence, um, and also in Haura the, um, there's the Light, Lysart Watt Gallery, and there's also a, a trust that um, has a biennial art award of $3,000 each year beginning in 2013. And I have spoken to a few of Mary's friends, and one said she was a modest woman, and she was not into native plants, um, and didn't have much lawn on her property. 
and she loved the Burmese honeysuckle. So wrapping up in the final minute, um, Mary Lysart suffered the same fate as many female English landscape architects of the same and earlier generations. She, was, she quickly fell into oblivion as soon as she ceased to practice. Her rediscovery and through her discovery of some of her highly trained female cohorts has revealed an aspect of New Zealand landscape history that has been overlooked to date. Finally, we would appreciate any leads to potential correspondence with Mary over the period of her six years OE, along with any information concerning Australian connections she may have made during the 1950s. And she had a, a great diverse range of correspondence, and I think her 12 folders in the Turnbull are only just part, part of, obviously, a, an expansive career. And thank you very much. Just, just there acknowledging, um, importantly, Mary, um, uh, Wendy Garvey, who was the person who directed me to her manuscript those years ago. <laughs> so we've, we've got probably about five minutes for questions. Anyone have? Um, hello, thank you very much. It's most informative. Um, just one question is, no, I think the gardens that she designed are still intact as such? Too. And where they are, so we can just maybe drive past and look at the trees, even. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that I believe um, the, there's a, a very new book just being published about um, Bill Such's wife, um, and in that new book, you'll see in the bookshops uh, there are images of um, the Such property, and the, the image I believe shows uh, one of the banks, uh, and we know that Mary was planting a lot of uh, native plants, hebes, in the two or three plans that survive. Um, now, I haven't personally been on that property to see what remains today. Um, but no, to answer your question, that, that's probably the next phase uh, in trying to unravel um, Mary's career um, as, as to where. Um, and the sad thing, of course, that, that, that uh, Welsh uh, site was um, demolished in the early 2000s. It, it had a high heritage status, but um, it was sadly demolished. And we, we know that Mary was doing all the drafting for Peter Youngman, and she describes cycling to various bu buildings in London to get documents copied. So, she, and the the image you saw at the beginning, she is at her desk, and on the floor there's a pile of um, garden plans. Uh, my thinking is those plans were drawn for one of the housing division. Uh, divisions and they were sort of for, for some of those people who bought homes to give them a, a guidance. Mm. But none of those, sadly, none of those have even survived in the public records. Um, they didn't, wouldn't tend to have, but um, no doubt somebody who, who owned one of those properties who kept Mary's plan will be, it be great value today. Mm. So. Any other questions? I've got one. Sure. Could you get Stuart a mic, please? Sorry, John, you were saying some delicious things to me about her family and the margins, and perhaps that would be of interest, like where did this woman come out of was kind of interesting too, yeah? Her, her folks or their, their family networks? Can you say a little bit more about that? Um, yes, well, the, her, her family, um, I was actually looking at a couple of photograph albums that, that are actually titled Mary Watt, Mary Lysart Watt, but they're actually of her parents. Um, and of the uh, 1920s. Um, th they were obviously a very um, um, outdoors uh, family uh, with, with lots of friends, um, and there were images of them on skiing trips and tramping trips and places like the Uruweras. Uh, lots of images actually um, of them living and staying um, on Marae and, um, and meeting houses, some very famous meeting houses. I think the images, if the Turnbull's not aware, will be of of national interest, I think, because this particular meeting house um, has had a lot of recent news, and there it is with the Maori chief and the owners standing um, uh, in the front of the building. But yes, yeah, so it was that network of family, um, and because the dad was, um, or Nolene's dad was a bureaucrat within government, and uh, Mary, Mary's parents were more farming families, but um, it was um, the friendships. Um, 
and that support that I think got Mary through. Um, mm. Great. Can we all please um, thank John again for his um, wonderful presentation.